me. Uh, so a quick introduction of myself. Um, I'm working as a head of machine learning and artificial intelligence in Framtin, uh, which is a insurance company based in Norway. So uh, really quickly, it's a merger between Sparbank One Insurance and DMB Insurance. Uh, and we are mainly distributing our insurance uh, in the, our respective owner banks. Um, so, going from actuaries to machine learning engineers. Uh, I don't know, sh just a quick raise of hands. Uh, how many works in insurance here? Two, two and a half. <laughs> That's good. Uh, because I have some slides that are a bit more specific on uh, how does insurance work and so forth. So that would be wasted if uh, everybody was uh, working in insurance. Um, yeah, so obviously uh, going to a party and selling and uh, when people ask what are you working as and you tell them you're working in insurance and I'm, or an actuary. Uh, Usually, the conversation ends there or is uh, quickly turned into something other. But if you can say that you're a machine learning engineer and working with artificial intelligence, uh, then you're on. Then you have lots to talk about. So, so that's kind of the quick reason for going from actuaries to machine learning engineers. On the more sort of technical side of things, uh, Insurance is interesting in the sense that uh, you have a long tradition of using statistics and statistical models in productions, which has a big impact on sort of the business business outcome. Uh, but what is it basically about? So first. Uh, as a an holder of an insurance product, you pay a small am amount in advance and then uh, you let the uh, company take the big payment if an event occurs, right? So a bit simply said, what you pay as a customer is the product of the probability of an event occurring times what that event costs. Often translating to, uh, for instance, if you have a decent home, you pay 10,000 per year instead of 10 millions if a large if it burns down or a large event occurs. So that is basically the value proposition of insurance. And as value propositions goes, uh, you could argue that it also, it is a bit meaningful. So, so although insurance company doesn't really have a good reputation necessarily for, for creating meaningful products, there is something about the uh, value proposition that, that actually can, uh, can be used in that sense. But then, if you put insurance into a market, so you have a market of insurance companies that are competing against each other, you get some interesting market effects. So first of all, why can insurance company uh, make money? Uh, the law of large numbers is sort of uh, gives sort of uh, the business in itself, um, which basically states that if you pull together a bunch of similar risks that are independent, then the average payout will trend to the expected value of them. So if you have enough data to model the expected value, 
then you can also price the products in a good way. But if you put this into the market, then you get another interesting effect, which is called adverse selection. And that is an effect that arises in, in, in different areas uh, and in different businesses, but it is closely linked to if the cost of the product that you are selling depends on the customer who is buying, uh, then you might end up in a situation where you get adverse selection. Quickly said, or quickly illustrated, if you sort of divide your customers up in good risk and bad risk, or sort of split them up in uh, who will have the most probability of an event, if you can price the good risk lower than your competition, you will get, you will attract uh, the people you are making money on and sort of push away the people you are losing money on. Which then gives insurance company is huge incentives of being accurate in their predictions, in their price settings. Um, and of course, this has to be balanced. Uh, uh, prices have to be sort of uh, uh, also be uh, not way off from what the market uh, expects. So, so, so it's not. It's not. Uh, it's a bit too simple to say that you want to uh, find the risk of the person. You also have to, to, to have a price that the market is capable of uh, taking. Okay. So uh, this is the resource, uh, Prediction Machines from II Agrival. Uh, it's sort of my favorite resource for explaining the impact of machine learning and, arch uh, and artificial intelligence for uh, business people, managers, different stakeholders. Um, he basically sta states that there are three large effects of machine learning and artificial intelligence, and they all come from the same point that machine learning and artificial intelligence lowers the cost and increases the accuracy of predictions. So if you are running a business that is based on doing predictions accurate, like insurance, sort of the first thing you should do is to implement machine learning in those already, th those processes, processes there are already there. Uh, and the best example for that is uh, pricing in insurance. Uh, the second effect is that as the price of predictions become low, it will start to solve problems that were previously not thought as, uh, as prediction problems. Uh, an example of that uh, is uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, which weren't, at least not uh, if you go 15 years back, thought of as a prediction problem, but is solved as a prediction problem now. Same with uh, different types of image recognition uh, solution and services. Uh, the second, or the third effect, is that it will sort of impact the value of substitutes and complements. And I think that this point is interesting, especially in, a, in an insurance perspective, uh, because you can sort of view insurance as a complement of uh, 
good predictions. You buy insurance because you don't know what's going to happen, right? But if you knew what were going to happen with a higher degree of certainty, you might not be that interested in buying insurance. Okay, let's see at two specific use cases. So, so I already mentioned this before. Uh, so this falls into the first category where we are using machine learning in processes that are uh, already prediction based. So we are basically exchanging the traditional generalized linear models or the traditional general additive models that have been used in insurance pricing for 10 to 20 years with boosted uh, boosted trees models, and are also experimented with using neural networks. Uh, and and the reason is, we sort of want to move in the diagram between growth and profitability. And the model complexity is one of three factors that are making us able to position yourself in that diagram. The second use case uh, that we have developed and which has been in production is sort of a bit on the other side. So we are using image recognition in the claim handling process where we uh, look specifically at the windshield claims. <laughs> the objective there was to find something that was simple enough <laughs> but had, a, uh, had some amount of volume. So for us, we have uh, around, uh, I would say 30,000 windshield claims each year, pay out uh, 200 million Norwegian kroners which is roughly the same in Swedish corners, in just windshield claims. And there is one guy who is responsible for making sure that those payments are, are, uh, are correct. Most of it goes just straight through. Uh, and the reason for that is that usually the amounts are, are low. But we also know that uh, uh, body shops uh, is a dirty business and they like to uh, cheat us and their customers in, in different ways. So it's a value added to put some more control mechanisms in place. So what we are basically doing in the version two is that we are reading from images what windshield was put into the car. And then we are uh, looking that up into market databases to compare the price that they are charging us compared to the price of the, of the windshield in the market. And we are finding uh, some good discrepancies between those two numbers. Zooming a bit back out again. Uh, what, what is the potential of machine learning and artificial intelligence in insurance? So I find it interesting to look at uh, mobility space uh, and try to analyze a bit what is going on there and see if we can extrapolate from that to other sort of insurance products and, and, and uh, businesses. So, uh, from an insurance perspective, what is interesting in the mobility space? So you sort of have two technologies there. Uh, telematics, which basically means that you put something in your car that monitors your driving, and from that, you get a bunch of data to, to see 
uh, how well different drivers are driving, and then you can try to tie that into crashes and use the driving behavior to be more accurate in predicting who is going to get claims or not. Uh, and then, on the sort of high-tech end, uh, you have self-driving cars, which from an insurance perspective might be considered as an existential threat. Right? If you have cars that don't crash, why should people buy insurance? And, and all of these technologies are based on machine learning. So there are predictions on each and every one of them. But there is sort of an increase in complexity, but there's also an increase in uh, the accurateness of the predictions. So the self-driving car is able to do something with what it is predicting. An insurance company is usually not. So the cost of doing preventive measures from an insurance perspective are usually too high because we can't accurately predict who is most likely to be affected of an event. But if we can increase that accuracy, we could potentially move the insurance business from being sort of a reactive, you pay out when something has happened, to be a bit more preventive. But then sort of the insurance company has to wake up a bit because in the mobility space, that capability has been captured by the self-driving car people. Uh, so we are sort of out of the game when it comes to that. And, and, and so far, telematic hasn't really proved itself to be, to, to have a good enough value proposition. So it sits sort of a bit in between the traditional space where we certainly have a good value proposition, uh, f especially if you take into consideration the amount of data that we collect and so forth. Uh, but in the telematics space, you collect a lot of data, but do you really create any value? So that's sort of uh, uh, a case. Okay, so I'm going to try to talk a bit faster. So the next slide is more about how have we put machine learning into production. Into production. What do you need? So first of all, you need good people. Everybody knows this. Uh, sort of the profile that we have had the most success with are typical um, coming from backgrounds of uh, mathematics uh, and uh, statistics, physics, that has some professional experience with software development. So they, they don't necessarily have to be working as data scientists or machine learning engineers at the moment, but if they have a sufficiently strong academic background and has the uh, the experience of building software in an enterprise setting, you should try to get them on board. And, and they're not that hard to find. You need data, and you need to sort of change the enterprise architecture thinking. It's been really focused on service, service, so it's been very service oriented uh, lately, but you need to get sort of the data on their agenda. And as it was noted earlier in the keynote, best practices for software development, go DevOps, CI, CD, works 
works well enough for, for machine learning, so there's no reason for not implementing it in your machine learning products. And lastly, uh, <laughs> if you're not in the cloud, uh, try to get there fast. <laughs> yes, that's it for me. Thank you.